Chase and I will be headed out this afternoon going to the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention. The hot topic of uh, conversation has been for the last year or maybe two years of uh, the idea of election versus free will. Now, we studied that at length on Sunday evening a, a while back, but as we consider our our text for today, and really what we'll be looking at in Luke chapter 5 is the call of a disciple. It matters not whether you consider the idea that it is a Calvinist thing, uh, an election thing, where you have to have the inner call and the outer call that come together, or whether you're Armenian and it's just a, a, an outer call that brings you to faith in Jesus Christ. It all begins with a call. And as I have done on numerous occasions, and will do again uh, when I have the opportunity, I, I apologize to many of you for your time where you received the call from Jesus Christ, and you were told that this is an easy salvation. And you were told that if you just simply walk the aisle and go through the baptistry, that that's all there is to it. Because as we will see today in the call of the disciples, as we continue our series, Dare to Be a Disciple, where I'm daring you to choose to be a radical disciple of, of Jesus Christ. And as we look at the call placed on the life of these, these men, we see that there is much more to it than walking an aisle and praying a prayer and walking through some giant bath, bathtub. But there is much more involved than that. And I, and I hope that when you consider the call that God's placed on your life, that you first of all make your election and calling sure. Secondly, see that there is much more to it than just the idea of following Jesus down an aisle and, and through a, a baptistry. Well, I want us to read together in chapter 5 of, of Luke. I told you last week we will spend the majority of our time in Luke, and we will. Um, so today is when we really begin that. We're going to look at verses 1 through 11. Again, I encourage you, if you, if you don't have a paper Bible, you, you're free to look at one. There's several on the, some of the chairs that have baskets underneath them. If not, it will be on the screen, but I don't want you to lose finding the Bible because that can be very embarrassing, finding a book of the Bible. I was at Super Summer one year, Super Summer Executive Staff Training. If you know what that means, that means the guys who do all the teaching for this Super Summer. Super Summer was, the motto was, send us your best and we'll send them back better. And so they only asked youth ministers who supposedly... Uh, had things right in their life to come, and, and we had to go for a weekend training before the, uh, the uh, actual week took place. And I was at that training, and there were about, I don't know, two or 300 other youth ministers who were going to be leading Super Summer all across the uh, state of Texas, and I was asked to stand up and read from um, a, a very obscure book of the Bible, the Gospel of John. Um, yeah, and I couldn't find it. Now, it was long before the days of electronic Bibles and all that kind of stuff. I just, I just drew a blank and couldn't find the Gospel of John. And I kept looking and kept looking. And finally, the evangelism director for the state of Texas came over. And, you know, the, the longer it took me to find it, the worse it got. You know, then I began to sweat. And then I began to get all nervous. And all these guys are looking at me. And, and you don't know where the... And I didn't at the time know where the Gospel of John was. I couldn't find it. And so Chuck walks over, and he gets my Bible, and he turns to the page and points at it. And, of course, everybody just dies laughing. And I'm like, why does that have to happen to me? I don't want that to happen to you. Occasionally, we don't put this up here, and I'll go through stretches of weeks and months where I don't put the Scripture up there, but I'm inviting you to look at the Bible. And if you don't know it, if you don't know the Bible well enough to know where the book of Luke is, then I invite you to turn to the table of contents, look it up, really, really, look it up, and then um, you can go with us. So... Say all of that to say you need to know your Bible. All right, let's read verses 1 through 11 in Luke chapter 5. <clears throat> As the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear God's word, he was standing by Lake Gennesaret. He saw two boats at the edge of the lake. Now, let me just tell you, Gennesaret, same as Galilee, same Sea of Galilee, uh, Sea of Tiberias. You've heard those terms before. Um, some of you are like, I've never heard that. So back to verse 2. He saw two boats at the edge of the lake. The fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, which belonged to Simon, and he asked him to put out a little from the land. He sat down, and he was teaching the crowds from the boat. <coughs> when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let, your nets, let down your nets for a catch. Master, Simon replied, we have worked 
hard all night long and caught nothing. But at your word, I'll let down the nets. When they did this, they caught a great number of fish, and their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came, and they filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When, Jesus, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, because I am a sinful man, Lord. For he and all those with him were amazed at the catch of fish they took, and so were James and John, Zebedee's sons, who were Simon's partners. Don't be afraid, Jesus told Simon. From now on, you will be catching people. And they brought the boats to the land, left everything, and followed him. Now, evidently, this was the second time that Jesus had called these disciples to meet him. Well, why? Because there's several reasons why. You can look and see that they obeyed him, so they knew something, something was there. Um, uh, he had previously called these four fishermen, and you can look at Mark chapter 1 to get the chronology of the fact that Jesus had known them before this particular time. Andrew, Peter, James, and John, they, they had followed him, and they traveled with him in Capernaum and Galilee, but they had returned back to their fishing business. They had, they had followed him for a little bit and then gone back home. But this time, Jesus came to them with an idea that the time had come for a deeper commitment. And may I say to you that there will be those times in your life, no matter where you are spiritually, that Jesus will come to you. He's already given you some kind of call, but he will come to you and he will ask you for a deeper commitment. That's constant in the life of a believer. If it ever stops, then you have spiritual problems. There are constantly times where God says, I want you to do something more, something more for me. And so in those first three verses, we find that the preaching, of teaching of, uh, uh, preaching and teaching of Jesus had already attracted great crowds. He was walking around and people were following him. And, and there were so many people to this particular day, there was such a large crowd and he was, at the, he was already on the shoreline, and he was, he was trying to teach these people, but they kept crowding in and crowding in. And so he just said, well, let me get in the boat. He, he decides to do that, and he jumps in a boat that happens to be uh, Peter's or Simon's at the time. And it's a natural amphitheater, as you would know. It's, it's sloping down to the water, so he gets in it to use it as such. And he goes out a bit so that the people could see him. And after he finishes teaching the crowd, he issues instructions for these fishermen to put out their nets for a catch of fish. And that brings us to verse 4, where I want us to look at three principles, three great principles of this new and deeper call that God wants to give all of us. For some, it's the initial call to discipleship. It's the initial call to salvation where God says, you need to be saved. But for others, if everyone, everyone in here who says, I am a believer in Jesus Christ, there will be times like this where he calls you to do something new and do something different. I believe one of, if not the greatest plague on the New Testament church is the idea that we get to a place spiritually and we stop. We get comfortable in our spiritual life. And what I mean by that is we get to a place where we don't cuss, you know, and maybe we don't drink at all. Maybe you're a teetotaler or, or maybe you're just a social drinker. You don't, you don't get drunk. You, you get to a place where your life looks like all the rest of the believers in the world. And we just stop there. And we miss so much of what God has for us, of what Jesus is calling us to do. Now, he's not calling everyone into vocational ministry. We'll expound on that in just a few minutes. But he is calling everyone into a deeper commitment. And listen, whether you've been a believer for 10 days or whether you've been a believer for the last 20 years, I want you to hear today a new and fresh call from Jesus Christ. First thing that I want to look at is verses 4 through 7. The call to discipleship demands a greater commitment. Well, what does that mean? Greater, well, greater than when you are now, where you are now. And what that means for you, I can't give it to you in specifics, but I can give you principles and precepts based upon the fact that, that Jesus had spoken to these disciples before, and they had been with him, and then they went back, and then he called, and he said, look, everything's different this time. Simon had been washing and mending his nets. He was finishing up from fishing all night long. But he was doing like many of us do, and that is he had one ear on Jesus and one ear tending to his business. And I, and I know that, and I pray for this almost every week. You've heard me pray this. 
it's so difficult for us not to do that. It's so difficult for us, even for an hour, and we usually stay in here in about an hour and 15 minutes. It, even for an hour and 15 minutes, it is so difficult for us to block out everything in the world that we are much like Peter in that we have one ear tending to the things of Jesus, hearing him over here teaching while we're still cleaning and folding our nets for work the next evening. It's hard, isn't it? But Jesus says, look, I'm trying to get you to understand there's much more to this than just one ear. And you can rationalize that. I mean, after all, P Peter had responsibilities and duties to perform. That was his job. He had, he had to fish to, to make a living for his family. He had, to, he had to do that in order to provide for them. Jesus' call for Simon to launch out, launch out into the deeper water is a great analogy of what he wants to do in Simon's life. He's trying to teach him a life lesson here in fishing. Jesus is going to take Simon Peter to a deeper, more personal commitment to himself, to Jesus. But here's the thing. When, when we hear the call to launch out deeper, you and I, just like Peter, are tempted to compromise our obedience in several ways. And I, I want to go through these ways because you're going to see yourself in these and you need to jot these down or write them down in the place where you say, don't do this. Because here's what we do. And we so oftentimes rationalize all of these. We are tempted to be guided by our friends instead of what God said. Undoubtedly, the advice of his friends were, don't do that, Peter. These were veteran fishermen. And they hear this guy who, who's not a fisherman. He's a carpenter by trade. What does he know about fishing? He knows very little about it. So don't listen to him. You've worked all night. It's just a bad night. Count your losses and go on about your business. Go get rested up for tonight. <clears throat> you have your nets all cleaned and they're stored. If you go back out again, you're going to work hard. Nothing's going to happen, and you're going to have to clean them and fold them all over again. You know, and if you listen to some of your friends, here's what they're going to say. It's okay to go to church, but listen, don't get fanatical about it. And may I say to you that that is more and more going to be the case in the next decade. I believe with all of my heart we are now headed to, to an, toward an apathetic America when it comes to God. It's not that we are going to have all these atheists and, and agnostics like we have or used to have. They're even becoming more and more quiet. It's going to get to the point where, well, you know, that's fine for you, but I don't have any need for that. It's already headed there. And with the moral choices that we have made just a week or so, uh, less than a week ago, where we have said that, you know, that we care more about, uh, uh, about a, a political agenda than we do about babies. We care more about a political agenda than we do about what the Bible has to say about homosexuality. We are headed for a moral decline. And we have states that are now saying it is okay to recreational, recreationally use marijuana, no medicinal purposes, let's, let's just call it what it is, I appreciate their honesty, but I don't appreciate their morality. I'm telling you, we are headed for Europe. Save the fact that God changes us and we have a tremendous spiritual awakening. I'm not talking about a little flickering revival over here in West Texas or in the panhandle of Florida. I'm talking about a great spiritual awakening where people turn back to God and realize that the call of God is not for a few minutes or a few hours or a few days it is for a lifetime, then we are headed toward post-Christian Europe where you just don't care. Churches were closing in droves and still are in some places, but a few countries are experiencing a bit of revival. You say, don't get fanatical about it, and that's going to become more and more a catchphrase. Well, don't, don't come to me with your fanaticism. If you're not fanatical about Jesus, then you're wrong. And you are really wrong if you're more fanatical about anything else than you are about Jesus. Number two, we are tempted to be guided by our experiences instead of what God says. The Lord asked Peter to do something contrary to his own expertise in fishing. Peter is a professional fisherman. He knows fishing. 
He has been fishing all his life. He probably learned it from his dad. He's been fishing since he can walk. Since he was old enough to do something in the boat, he was with his dad. And according to everything he knows, he can't see any way at all that what Jesus asked him to do is going to work. And so he leans on his own experience. If he did lean on his own experience, he would say, I'm not going to do that. The best fishing on the Sea of Galilee was at night, and it was close to shore, not during the middle of the day and not in the deep part of the sea. He knew better than that. This was asking a great deal of Peter. He was asking, Jesus was asking Peter to trust him. He was saying, trust my words, Peter. Trust me. He was saying, try again, even though you failed in the past. Did you hear me? Jesus was saying to Peter, try again, even though you just recently failed. And as many of you hear something like this, and God begins to, to prick your heart, you immediately hear from the devil, why try again? How many times are you going to make this commitment? How many times are you going to say, I'm standing up for Jesus and fail? Peter had just failed miserably at fishing. What he was best at, he had failed at that. And Jesus comes on the scene and says, listen, I know you failed in the past, in the recent past, but don't, don't let that stop you. And this would be an incredibly important lesson for Peter in the future, would it not? When he absolutely denied, even cursed knowing Jesus Christ. And I want to ask you, are you going to allow past failure to keep you from following the call to be a disciple? Or won't you just dare to be a disciple? We can't allow our experiences to tempt us not to do what God tells us to do. Number three, we are tempted to be guided by our circumstances instead of what God says. Verse 5 reveals that Simon's answer, uh, it, it tells us what he was thinking. Master, we have toiled all night long and caught nothing. Now, if he would have stopped there, it would have been horrible. But he didn't. He, it, it tells us that he knows that Jesus is something special, not just some carpenter from, from Galilee. But he says, he finishes verse 5, he says, Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. By his reply, he communicates that, that he and his partners are dog-tired. That word translated toil indicates very hard work that most of us don't ever do anymore. They had not slept all night. They had worked hard all night fishing. And their circumstances said, I just can't do it. The circumstances of their past evening have indicated that, that further fishing will be fruitless. But Jesus was asking them to take these freshly cleaned and neatly folded nets, row out to the deep water, and go through the strenuous process of letting them out and taking in these nets all over again. They needed to learn obedience to Jesus, and they needed to learn that it should not hinge on favorable circumstances. Oh, how many times have we heard, how many times have you said, that when this and this and this happened, then I'll decide to follow through with my call to be a disciple. Then I will dare to be a disciple. Then I will really follow Jesus. How many times have we said that? If I can just get out of debt, if I can just get this, this relationship mended, if I can just, if I, we say that all the time. Peter very well could have said that, but he didn't. And so the question I end this point with is, will you allow your circumstances to dictate your obedience? Because they shouldn't. Number four, we are tempted to be guided by our fears instead of what God says. One of, if not the greatest obstacle that we face in life is our own fear. the fear of being inadequate, <clears throat> the fear of failure, the fear of rejection. We, we are guided oftentimes by our fear. And 
What fear is keeping you from doing what God really wants you to do? And it's not just you. You are not alone in this. As a matter of fact, there's a great biblical example of somebody who was afraid. In 2 Kings chapter 6, we have a beautiful picture of fear. Now, now let me set it for you. Um, Elisha has a servant, and the Arameans at this particular time were waging war against the nation of Israel. Now, Elisha was getting messages from God. God would come down, he'd whisper something in Elijah's ear, and he, Elijah would run to the king of Israel, and he'd say, hey, just going to let you know, they're coming this way today. And the king would say, great to know that. I'm going to go the other way. And so he kept doing that. Every day he would give this information to the king of Israel. And so the Arameans were just frustrated. The king of uh, Aram said, How, it, who in this room is taking these messages to the, to the king of Israel? He thought one of his own men were betraying him. And one of the guys said, no, it's not us. It's Elisha. It's this prophet from Israel. God is speaking to him. Even the things that, that you whisper in your bedroom, God is speaking in this guy's ear. So when they found out, they said, we've got to take this guy out. He's got to go. And so that's exactly what he did. The Bible says he sent horses, chariots, and a massive army to Dothan to take out Elisha. Now, here's the scene. All these these Hundreds, if not thousands, of horses and chariots and thousands of men definitely are surrounding Dothan. And Elisha's servant, servant came out one day to do chores. You know, I don't know what a servant did. You know, uh, Now they wash down cars. Maybe the servant was washing down the mules. He's outside. He's washing down the mules and taking care of things. And he's just kind of doing his job. And he kind of does a double take. He's like, oh, my word. This is not good. So he runs into the tent and he sees Elijah still sleeping, and he wakes Elijah and he says, "I told you to quit saying all that stuff to the king of Israel. I knew it was going. I told you to quit saying that." He's scared to death, and Elijah is kind of, you know, he's kind of groggy. He's just waking up. He's like, "Man, what? What in the world's going on? Where's my coffee?" And the servant says, "Man, we're in big trouble. There, there is a massive army out here to kill us." And so Elijah, you know, he's still kind of shaking things off, and he walks out and he's pouring his coffee and. He looks around, and he keeps pouring his coffee. He's very calm, nonchalant. And Elisha says, what, what? I mean, the servant says, what are you, what are you doing? And Elisha said, man, there are more with us than against us. And the servant says, man, you've been drinking? There ain't nobody here but me, you, and these mules. And then Elisha does something phenomenal. He begins to pray. And he asks God to open up the eyes of his servant. And as... His eyes, the eyes of the servant began to be open. He looks around and he sees on this mountain, not just hundreds or thousands, but the Bible says he sees that the mountain is completely covered with angels on chariots of fire. And he goes back and he says, I'm good. And I want you to know that you can't be guided by fear because when God tells you to do something, he is going to empower you to do it. Whether it's conquer an army by yourself and your servant and a couple of mules or whatever, or, or go next door and witness to your neighbor. You're, you're going to look with human eyes and you're going to say, I can't do that, I'm scared. And God's going to say, open up your eyes and see that the room is filled with angels on chariots of fire. God never asks us to do something that he will not give us what we need to accomplish the task. If he wants to help a nation conquer an opposing army, he will protect us. If he wants us to help them conquer that army, he will protect us to complete that task. If he wants us to win people to faith in him, he will empower us to do that, whether it's walking next door and knocking there and saying, hey, I want to tell you about Jesus, or it's getting in the plane and traveling for three days and going to West Africa and say, hey, I want to tell you about Jesus. Now back to the text. In Peter's reply, he reveals his respect for Jesus when he calls him Master. If you write in your Bible, underline the word Master or highlight it if you're on an electronic Bible. That's the Greek equivalent to the word Rabbi. Peter showed his love and respect for Christ by not letting his better judgment, his friends, his fear, his knowledge. All, he didn't let any of those things hinder his obedience to Christ. He did what God told him to do, even though it was ridiculous. So how does Jesus take us there? 
How does, how does Jesus take us from where we are, folding up our nets, cleaning them and laying them aside to where he wants us to be, dropping them down in the deep? How do we get to those places where he speaks to us ridiculous things and incredible things happen when we obey? He does it by pushing us. He didn't ask Peter. He didn't, he didn't say, you know, if you think it's the right thing. He pushed Peter. Peter was exhausted. He'd been up all night. All night, working, bringing the nets, throwing them back out. Now he was finishing up, getting ready for that rest. And you know how that's been. You've been ready to get off work, whatever it is that you do, and just a few minutes before you're ready to, you, you, you're mentally already shutting down for the day, and just a few minutes before you get ready to walk out the door, the boss or somebody who needs you walks in, and everything starts all over. You've been there. That's exhausting, isn't it? And Peter was that way. He heard from Jesus, and Jesus said, I know you're tired. I know everything. I know you don't think you can make this, but I'm going to push you. And, and let me say this to you. Perhaps doing things your own way has left you empty. And it's time for you to try God's way. Give God's way a try and see what happens. Maybe your own knowledge and skills have failed you and you, you feel like in life that, that you're just not where you need to be. Then you need to try God's knowledge and God's skills working through you. You need to do God, God's thing God's way. Maybe it's time for you today to obey God and to try things His way. Eat. Even if you don't understand where, even if you don't understand why, even if you don't understand how, even if you have a bunch of friends whispering in your ear, you're getting fanatical about this Jesus stuff. Might I say to you, that's probably a good place to be. And I realize that launching out into the deeper water is scary. It's less familiar. But it is also where God's blessings are found. You're not going to find a lot of stuff walking along the shoreline. Not because it's not there, but simply because so many people are there already. They're the ones going around picking up the treasures in the two-inch deep water. But you get out into the very deep water, and very few people ever get there. And so there's so much out there. And look at verse 6. The results of, of disobedience are recorded there in verse 6. When they did this, they caught a great number of fish, and their nets began to tear. In verse 7 emphasizes how much they signal their partners to come in the other boat to, to come help them they came they filled both boats so full that they began to sink and i want to tell you out in the deep out in the depths of the call of god for you to be a disciple the place where very few people ever go when god tells us to go we find all kind of reasons why we can't go when you go out there and you do what god tells you to do your next big blessing your next big issue is going to be oh my word I can't contain all of these blessings. They harvested their catch, the two boats, which each were seven and a half feet wide and over 27 feet long. They were filled so much that they began to sink. Several tons of fish were hauled ashore that day. And can't you just see the crowd? Remember all those people that were standing there listening to Jesus? You don't think they went away, do you? And so all these thousands of people who are watching this dialogue between Jesus and Peter, and then all of a sudden Peter's screaming about the fish, all these thousands of people begin to roar and applaud because this is the greatest catch they've ever seen. And so God honors those who obey him. The call to discipleship requires a greater commitment. And I don't know where God's asking you to cast your net, but he is asking you to do that. He's asking you to drop it somewhere, somewhere you've probably never thought to drop it, some place where you would look and say, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. God still asks us to do radical stuff. It's not a convenient call that he puts on your life. It's not that you go to school and you get a job and you get married and you have kids and then to complete your life you say, well, I'm going to go to church. It is that God calls you to be a disciple and you take the dare to be a disciple and everything changes to the point where 
All things are filtered through the call that God has placed on your life. And today, he's asking you to do something he's never asked you to do before. Next week, he's going to do the same thing, except he won't be asking you to do the same thing. Unless you are one of those people who have gotten to a place in your Christian walk and you've stopped. And so Jesus says, I'm asking you to do this. I'm asking you to throw your nets out into the deep in the middle of the day. And you don't do it. And so next week, he's going to ask you to throw your nets out in the deep in the middle of the day. And you don't do it. And the next week and the next week, he's going to keep asking you to do the same thing. And you're thinking, why am I not growing? Why am I not hearing from God? Because God has told you what to do and you haven't done it yet. Why are my prayers not being answered? Why do I feel like I don't hear from God anymore? Because he's told you what to do and you haven't done it. And once you do it, then the issue no longer becomes, am I hearing from God? The issue becomes, oh my word, I need to call some other brothers in to help get the blessings because I have so many of them that I can't contain them all. It's a call to a greater commitment. It's also a call, an invitation rather, to greater intimacy. A call to discipleship is an invitation to greater intimacy. Look at verse 8. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, because I am a sinful man. And that verse gives us the effect that this miracle had on Peter. First, it seems strange when you look at it, and God blesses him in such an incredible way. And Peter says, Leave. But we have to understand the scene in light of what has happened. This new revelation of the power and glory of Jesus has given Peter an acute sense of his own sinfulness. Peter, Peter was not really trying to get rid of Jesus. He was simply saying, I'm overcome with a sense of my own unworthiness. And when he calls Jesus Lord at this particular point, it's an entirely different word than he used there in verse 5. This term, Lord, is kurios, and it is reserved by the Jews as a description of God. And, and the first time he called him Lord, you remember we said it was master, teacher, rabbi. This, he's calling him God. He recognizes who he is. Peter's reaction is what we often see in the Bible as, as man's reaction to a face-to-face -face confrontation with God. You remember in Isaiah chapter 6, the Bible says, uh, Isaiah saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and he immediately declared, Woe is me, for I am undone. Job had much the same experience. He said, I've heard of you by hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And John would write uh, of his experience in Revelation chapter 1. He said, and, and when I saw the Lord, I fell at his feet as dead. When first introduced to the power and majesty of the Lord, we are immensely aware of our own sin and do not know what to do but to try to escape from his presence. And for many, that's why silence in the presence of God is uncomfortable. It's because they haven't learned how to deal with being in the presence of God. And as he reveals himself, it scares us. Simon asked Jesus to leave him. Not because he doesn't want to be in his presence, but because he feels unworthy of being there. And you need to understand, you are unworthy of being in the presence of God. If there's anybody in this room who thinks they're worthy to stand in the presence of God, you don't know God. But the great thing is, as our experience deepens, and we gain the knowledge that only in him can we experience the forgiveness of our sin, then a consciousness of our sin drives us to him instead of away from him. When you get that, and you understand that as Romans says, that it is the kindness of God that brings us to repentance, you run to your heavenly father to be forgiven. I want to illustrate this. In, in Peter's own life, according to John chapter 21, after the resurrection, Peter, deeply anguished over his denials of Christ, went back to Galilee in the calm of his old haunts and decided to go fishing, perhaps to clear his head, perhaps to think 
things through, to sort everything out. He just went back to what he knew. He and his old friends fished the night away without any success. Here, here's the same miracle at a different time. John has it at the end of the ministry of Jesus. Early in that morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize it was him. And he called to them. He said, friends, haven't you any fish yet? That's Jesus speaking. No, they answered. And he said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. And they'd heard that before, and so they did it. And then again, he fills the nets. Then the disciple, whom Jesus loved, that's the way John referred to himself, said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now here's the good part. As soon as Simon Peter heard John say, it is the Lord, the Bible says he wrapped his outer garment around him because he'd taken it off, and he jumped into the water, and he ran. And you can see this picture. Peter's standing there. He's got long hair. He's got a long beard. And so the water is dripping from his beard. And he's, he's still breathless from that plunge into the chilly water and running through the water to get to Jesus. He dashed to Jesus because he knew himself for what he was. He had already denied Jesus three times. He had already cursed the fact that he was with Jesus. And he knew the only way to find restitution, to find recompense for that, to find forgiveness was to go to Jesus. He better knew who Jesus was. And so he goes from get away from me because I am a sinful man to running to Jesus after he denied him. And I want to say to you, ladies and gentlemen, there are some of you that need to run to him today because you have stuff in your life that you know is sinful, and it's not that you should run away saying, I'm scared, but as you've grown in your depth and your understanding of Jesus, you know to come to him. And I want to tell you, that won't just be today either, because there'll be other times in your life where you have junk that needs to be dealt with. And we need to be like Peter after the lesson of the, the fish, and after the three times he denied him and run to him, dripping wet. The call to discipleship is an invitation to greater intimacy. But finally, the call to discipleship is the call to a new way of life. Let me read verses 9 through 11 just to remind you again. For he and all those with him were amazed at the catch of fish they took, and so were James and John, Zebedee's sons, who were Simon's partners. Don't be afraid, Jesus told Simon. From now on, you'll be catching people. Then they brought the boats to the land, left everything, and followed him. Jesus told Peter that his future business would not be catching fish, bringing them from life to death, but he would be catching men, bringing them from death to life. How good is that? Now, this word catch, translated in, in verse 10, literally means to catch alive. It, it means more like taking animals. It's more like trapping animals for a circus or a zoo. And when I studied that word and I think about the idea that they're catching them for a zoo, two things came to my mind. Two situations arise in thinking about the zoo. First, it seems that there are two kinds of Christians in the church. There are those who catch the animals for the zoo, and then there are those who just come to look. It's not the way it's supposed to be. Church is not a spectator society in which we go to the zoo to see what is happening. We're all supposed to be involved in the process. Second, when we do catch some, if I can use that phrase, we just cage them in an in inadequate environment. One of my favorite things to do when I travel is to go to zoos. I've been to zoos big and small. I mean, if I hear a little bitty town has a zoo or even a big town has a little zoo, I love to go to the zoo. And as I've seen them, I, I've seen going to these places where they have elaborate habitats for these animals that, that mimic where they live in, in the wild. I've also been to some that are very sad, that are just cages, and the animals are just caged. And here's something you can notice about them. If you go to the ones that have a habitat that is much like their environment, you will oftentimes see, let's look at the big cats, the lions and the tigers, doing what they do best. They usually sleep around 20 hours a day. Yes, I'm the nerd that reads the little placards there in front of every animal that makes you have to wait on me, but I love to do that. And they sleep an average of 20 hours every day. And if you see one sleeping, that means he's content. But you go to these ones that are in these little cages, and there's not too many of those anymore. And what do you see them doing? 
pacing, don't you? Pacing back and forth. You've even heard that term used. He's pacing like a caged animal. That's a symbol of anxiety. It, it, tells, it tells the people who know the animal that they are anxious about being there, that they don't want to be cooped up. And sometimes we catch people for Jesus and we put them in the cage of legalism or a cage of you've got to do it this way and you've got to be this way and you've got to say this way and we don't let the Holy Spirit teach them. And it's like, it's like a cage on a Bengal tiger. That majestic animal has no business being confined to a small cage. He's a great predator who needs to hunt for his food. A Christian not finding a new way of life when they accept the call to be a disciple is like a caged tiger. Look, when you have, you have Jesus living in you and you're not letting him out, you're going to be anxious to do more. And through this miracle, Peter now sees Jesus in an entirely new light. Jesus is Lord and Peter is a sinful man. Peter saw his reluctance to obey the Lord's command, and he saw that the fact that he, he, he didn't do it immediately was sin. And Jesus responds in the second half of verse 10 by a command not to fear and to promise Peter that you will now be a fisher of man. These men had their lives changed forever. We don't think about this often. But remember, that was the biggest catch they'd ever had. And what does the Bible say they do? They did. Did we hear about them folding their nets? Did we hear about them taking that great load of fish and selling it? They left it. Most people miss that when they read that. They left it. The greatest thing that had ever happened to them in their life, they left it because Jesus said, now follow me. You think this is cool that you got three or four tons of fish and the whole crowd is applauding enthusiastic, applauding enthusiastically because you made the greatest catch they've ever seen. Let me show you what you're really going to be doing. You're going to be fishers of men. Now leave all that and follow me. And they did. Now what would your friends be saying about that? Oh, wait a minute. You need to go sell. That's stupid. It's bad stewardship not to sell that fish. What about your boats? What about your nets? You... Jesus said, just come on. Just follow me. Verse 11, they left their boats to land, left everything, and they followed him. The response leaving everything implies a couple of questions. First, must all disciples leave their vocations to serve Jesus? Second, <clears throat> how is the call to believers like and unlike this call to Peter? The answer to these questions emerge from history uh, of the New Testament church. As the New Testament letters show, not everyone is called to full-time ministry. Paul kept right on working as a tent maker when he ministered. The important, important element is that the call to walk with Jesus takes priority that it is more important to you than anything else. Some will be called to go overseas. Some will be called to stay right where they are. It doesn't matter. The mission is the same. The mission is catching men. That's what the mission is. This morning, God is coming to you and he's calling you by name. You know that he, he wants you, not just someone. He wants you. He wants a deeper commitment out of you. He wants greater intimacy with you. He, he wants to call you to a new way of life. He's inviting you to join him in a powerful mission to a lost and dying world. What keeps you from answering the call? We've given you a great list of excuses. Here's one thing that, that I hope, if you've been here any length of time, that you understand. This is not a place where you can come and sit and be comfortable as a mediocre Christian. I don't want it to be comfortable for lost people. Oh, there was a time when, when most churches were saying, hey, we, we need to be seeker sensitive, seeker friendly, and, and lost people need to come in here and be comfortable. Wrong. If, if they can come in, into God's presence and be comfortable, then we're not, we're not showing them the right God. I mean, look at what Peter did when he realized who Jesus was. I got to get out of here. And that's not only true for lost people, but it's true for those who are living out their Christianity Eh, in a laissez-faire attitude. I don't ever want people who are just mediocre uh, in their commitment to Christ to be comfortable because it's a scary place to be, spiritually speaking. And today I'm asking you, what has God put in your life? What has he shown you? For some of you, it is you need to go back to that place he last spoke to you and told you to do something. He told you to drop your nets in the deep and you never did it. Others of you, know exactly what God's asking you to do today. 
And it's time to make that deeper commitment. For some of you, it's leaving sin. For others of you, it's obeying a specific task. What is it?